Welcome everyone at our weekly co colloquium. Our speaker today is our own uh, Dr. Krzysztof Pawłowski. Uh, and he will tell us about uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, in particular how many atoms are in Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. At the end of this talk, I will present results, the, uh, experimental results which were obtained by a Danish group which were supported by our theory. That's why there is so many authors there. As it's supposed to be colloquium, um, therefore I decided to do very, very elementary talk. So most of the talk, it will be just introduction, during which I would like to present you what is Bose-Einstein condensate in the historical context, then about some problems concerning how many atoms is in the, are in, the, in, the, in this condensate. So there'll be a part about fluctuations of the number of atoms. And then at the end, this uh, experiment I, I was talking uh, about. So let me start with something very, very simple. Uh, Puppies in schools, they are often asked this question, in how many ways the sum of two thrown dice is four? And these students usually they choose two options, not one. They do, usually they are divided into two groups. Yes, so like half of puppies is answer, answering that there are three options because you can have four if there are two in both dice or there is one on the first one and three on the second or there is three on the first dice and one on the second. So there are three options. But other puppies would answer that there are two ways because either there is two, two, or one, three. And you can, uh, thinking in this way, you can compute what is the probability of having four, four in, such a, in such a toss, and then you can do an experiment by repeating throwing dice uh, several times, and then you will find that this first answer is the correct one, and it's correct one because the uh, dice are distinguishable. But actually, I wouldn't blame these two students, these students who choose option number two, because it's, it's actually not so obvious what does it mean that dice is distinguishable. I mean, even if they have the same mass, the same color, even if they are identical, still they are distinguishable. Just by, let's say, possibility that you can put a dot on one do dice and then uh, you could uh, distinguish them. And historically, there are many famous mistakes and problems connected with this problem, with this distinguishability. Probably the most known is the cavalier uh, Demer problem, who asked the question, what is the probability of that the sum of two, three thrown dice is, is uh, 11 or 12? And it was solved immediately by Pascal. But even if you take famous books like uh, Encyclopedia written by D'Alembert, he was speaking about probability, about the result of throw of two coins, and also there is a mistake in, a, in a encyclopedia, which is slightly connected with, the, connected with this distinguishability problem. The distinguishability was also a subject of many debates among philosophers. Uh, there was discussion what is identity, what is indistinguishability, and uh, roughly speaking, they decided in 19th century that two objects are always distinguishable just because you can say that one is on the left and the second is on the right, let's say. But um, this distinguishability causes many problems in physics. In, uh, in 19th century, there was this big Gibbs paradox. So Gibbs wanted to compute uh, entropy, and he, well, he shown that actually entropy as computed uh, in an elementary way is not extensive. And this is, roughly speaking, Gibbs paradox. So distinguishability, which is true, we know it from dice, gave some, well, led to some problems in, in physics also. So let me now start with uh, Satyendra Nath Bose. This is an uh, Indian, he was Indian physicist. And uh, he was giving lecture about Planck's law. He was deriving Planck's law that the uh, aim of his lecture was to show some uh, discrepancies in, uh, when he was, he was deriving it in an in elementary way. But during this lecture, he did some mistake, or he thought that this is a mistake, namely he 
assume that photons are indistinguishable, but because of this mistake, he received correct result. That's why later he wrote a paper about uh, alternative derivation of the Planck's law using indistinguishability of photons. And this paper was rejected, so he sent this paper to Einstein asking for help. No in which journal it was? Uh, in which it was rejected, I don't know. But finally, after recommendation of Einstein, actually Einstein uh, translated this paper to German and recommended in a Zeitschrift for Physik, and it was uh, published. But uh, actually many physicists were strongly against this, uh, this indistinguishability of particles. So here is the part of the letter of Ehrenfest to Joffe. And Ehrenfest, uh, in 1924, he was uh, discussing with Einstein about this indistinguishability, and he wrote to Joffe, Einstein, Einstein is with us, we agreed that the disgusting work of Bose is meaningless. <laughs> but on the other hand, apparently he was not so convinced because during next year, Einstein wrote three papers. <laughs> he started the first paper saying, well, this uh, idea of Bose is strange, but it gives elegant result. If we would take it seriously, then we should use it also for atoms. And then he wrote three papers about uh, atoms using indistinguishability of atoms. So what Einstein exactly did, um, he was considering a box with periodic boundary condition, three-dimensional one, and he was interested in the statistical properties of ideal gas at thermal equilibrium. So just ideal gas, no interaction whatsoever. And the method he, he was using was um, he used the phase space, so we have on x axis x position, on y axis is momentum. Uh, he divided the whole phase space into elementary cells of the volume uh, equal to Planck constant. And then, uh, actually, the whole statistic is just combinatorics. In how many ways you can place a different number of atoms in these cells, like, like X in the X bo egg, egg box, but uh, you can have maybe more particles per cell. And uh, as before, there are two ways of counting, because you can either choose distinguishable particles, and if you know that uh, there are two particles with the same momenta, but at different position, you can say first one is on the left, the second is on the right, or the second is on the left, first is on the right. This would be for distinguishable particles. But Einstein used uh, this concept of indistinguishability where this was just one option. We have two atoms, one is on the left, the second on the right. And he introduced probability of having in cell number S, so he labeled the cells, uh, R particles. So PSR probability that there will be R atoms in the cell number S. Uh, he imposed two constraints, that the average number of atoms is fixed and the average energy is fixed, but uh, they, were, they could fluctuate, but just the averages were, were assumed to be uh, given. And then by the standard method, namely by maximizing entropy with respect to these probabilities, he found all these probabilities, what means he found all statistical properties. The first thing he computed was this average occupation of cell number S, and this formula is famous uh, Bose-Einstein uh, constant. Uh, Isn't the case that the averages are basically fixed or constant because this is what reflects the stasi-quatic equilibrium of the system? Otherwise, mm -hmm. can you assume that average won't change because the system is in equilibrium, or uh, does that actually stem from any other uh, physical principles? Uh, actually, I will, I will come to this, uh, this point later, because it's a really important point, actually, for the talk. What does it mean and what are the consequences? Um, okay, so he actually, when he used his, these statistics, he, he was able to resolve some problems like uh, Gibbs paradox. So when he used these indistinguishable atoms, he computed entropy and entropy was extensive as it should be. But also he found something very strange. I mean, when he computed density of atoms with higher momenta, not equal to zero. So n is the number of, nx is the number of uh, excited atoms, let's say. Then he found that the 
n over v, so density, times what is a thermal wavelength to power 3, well, it cannot exceed some value. There is some critical value of this critical, uh, there is some critical value of density. Uh, so this critical value is defined by this uh, expression. It means that if you would compress isothermally the system, in this way you would increase the density, then density will exceed this critical one defined by this equation, and then these extra atoms forming the, the, the rest of the density, they, they would have to accumulate in momentum equals zero. They cannot be excited. This was the idea of Einstein. Here is the same, but, uh, well, written in, a, in the graph with energy. So both the Einstein condensate is such, this is gas in such a regime that almost all atoms occupy the ground state and the rest of them is in these uh, higher levels. And one has to stress that this is a high temperature effect. By high temperature, I mean that the uh, average energy per, per atom, so, so let's say KBT, is much, much larger than E1, than the energy of the first excited state. So the average energy per atom is somewhere in the sky, because in experiments like 10 to 3 or 10 to 4 of E1, and even though almost all atoms are in the ground state. This is the well, surprising result of Einstein. Uh, instead of thinking like Einstein about compressing the system, you can uh, think differently that you have some average fixed number of atoms, but you would lower temperature. Then the same equation would give you the critical temperature. And if you go with temperature down, so you cool down the gas, then at some point, uh, below the critical temperature, almost all atoms would occupy the, the ground state. And, well, this, uh, this curve follows just this formula. And uh, you see here that there is will be discontinuity in the, uh, in the derivative, which would express that this is a phase transition, single order phase transition. So again, what is this Bose-Einstein condensate? In both the Einstein condensate would have regime, you'd have like two phases. If you have box and atoms inside, many atoms, maybe almost all of them, they would just be motion, motionless, they would just levitate. And the rest of them, the, the phase, which is called normal phase, uh, this phase would have uh, just typical Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of, of velocities. Uh, and often it's exp this Bose-Einstein condensation is expressed yet in another words that if you compute uh, the average, the, the thermal uh, wavelength, which is given here, in Bose-Einstein condensate this is uh, larger than the average distance between atoms. So you have to think about atoms as some wave, and in Bose-Einstein condensate these waves overlaps and because of bosonization, then bosonization, they, they uh, interfere constructively, yes? Take the question. But this is interesting to notice that uh, this momentum can only be expressed with respect to the, to the inertia or rest frame, because if you would have a system uh, undergoing uh, external acceleration, I guess the occupation would be different, right? So basically, we don't ma we don't actually see this because gravity has the tendency to, to basically, uh, if you're free falling, you don't feel it, right? But if you would have external acceleration, the system would have different occupations. So this is like inter inertial rest frame of the atoms when the momentum will be zero. The temperature would depend on the acceleration. That was solved exactly in Einstein's experiment. Yeah. 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 I could extend my argument, but I will postpone it for the for the later. Uh, uh, no, but the question is, is uh, well, well, well posed. Yes, indeed. Uh, it, it wouldn't change much. It's actually, in the the real experiments, we have, of course, this uh, gravity. We have to account it, and uh, and it's um, it's some shift in the energy, but doesn't change anything. Um, 
Okay, but if you put numbers, you will find that this critical temperature for real system it can be around 100 nano Kelvin. So I said that this is high temperature effect, but it's high temperature when you compare with the statistics of indistinguishable atoms, but in absolute values is, is very low temperature. And actually one can think, uh, and this was the, the argument of Uhlenbeck, that maybe the result of Einstein is meaningless because at such low temperature, you would not expect gas. Yes, there should be some solid piece of metal, not, not gas. Uh, but to have gas out of, uh, to have solid out of gas, you need, in fact, three body collisions because two atoms they have to meet and form the bound state. But then to have the conservation of energy, you need the third atom, which would carry out this uh, kinetic energy, such that the uh, conservation of energy would be fulfilled. What means that if you make the gas very dilute, such, three body, such that three-body collisions are very rare, then uh, you can keep metastable gas for a long time, even minutes. And well, to reach this uh, very low temperature, there are many techniques invented how to cool gas. There are two very important ones. Well, first is Doppler cooling, when you shine on atoms with a laser. The laser is out of resonance, but uh, it's tuned such that if some atoms, they have such velocity that the Doppler, see, the Doppler shift they see will put them to resonance, then these atoms will absorb photons. So their momentum would be decreased by uh, momentum of photon. Then they have to emit this photon via spontaneous emission, but they emit it in random directions. So uh, if you tune this laser, you have six lasers in six directions, and tune their frequency in time, you can, uh, in average, lower the average momentum of atom, what means you can uh, lower the, the temperature. And the second uh, very simple way of cooling is so-called evaporative cooling. So if you had atoms, let's say, in harmonic trap, you can open it such that, but only partially, such that only the most energetical atoms would just uh, escape, the lower energy atoms will remain, and average temperature will go down. And uh, both the Einstein condensate was uh, obtained in uh, one year, actually, by two or three groups. Uh, what you see here is the, uh, is the density in the uh, momentum space. This is the famous experimental result, actually. They were able to measure density in momentum space. And this first picture corresponds to a relatively high temperature where this, uh, this density was following the, uh, the distribution of normal phase, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution practically. And then if you lower the temperature, you see peak, which was more or less matching with the ground state. So they said, oh yes, these atoms, they had to, forming the peak, they were occupying the ground state. This is Bose-Einstein condensate. And here is a graph similar to the one uh, from the previous slide. On y-axis, it's number of atoms. On uh, x-axis, we have temperature. And we see that uh, when the temperature is lower, then these experimental points, they follow more or less the uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical curve. I said more or less because they are quite scattered. And this experiment was just done uh, one year after BC, 1996. Okay, but there was some criticism, very old criticism, raised by already Elvin, Erwin Schrödinger, who used the method of Einstein to calculate the average number of atoms, but also he computed uh, fluctuations. So here is the formula for fluctuation of the number of atoms in the ground state. And well, actually from the ground canonical ensemble, it's, not, it's clear that this fluctuation, it has to be equal to the average number of atoms in the ground state times this average plus one. This is just exact simple formula. But if the temperature will go to zero, then of course the this n naught number of atoms in the ground state would tend to the total number of atoms. Because we expect that if temperature is zero, all atoms would occupy the ground state. I'm still speaking about ideal gas. What means that these fluctuations would be equal to n square. So, well, 
According to this derivation, these fluctuations are unphysically large because from short to short, either all atoms would be in condensate or maybe zero atoms would be in condensate because fluct maybe even more atoms or maybe yes. Yeah. <laughs> and this is also yeah, this is true that according to this computation, there may be more atoms in condensate than it is in average. And where is the problem? Quick reminder that to do some computation in, in frame of the statistical mechanics, we are using ensembles. And uh, the ensemble which Einstein was using uh, is grand canonical ensemble, is uh, towards your question, Wojtek. Uh, in this ensemble, energy is uh, fixed in average, but it can fluctuate. And number of atoms also is calculating. And this ensemble is used in a, typically in you, if you consider some small system which is embedded in some reservoir, such that, or in contact with a reservoir with which we can exchange particles. So this reservoir, this buff, it dictate uh, dictates what is temperature, so average energy, what is chemical potential, so average number of uh, atoms. We have other ensembles, like canonical one, where energy fluctuates, but number of atoms is fixed. By this I mean that the fluctuation of the total number of atoms is zero. And microcanonical, in which uh, both energy and number of atoms cannot fluctuate. And Einstein used this grand canonical ensemble, but if you think uh, how experiment is done, well, they, they separate some cloud of atoms and they cool it down. So that there is no reservoir of uh, particles, no reservoir of energy, so one should use microcanonical ensemble, which is, however, very difficult to use. But people will try to do some, to some extent, some computation. They found, actually, that microcanonical and canonical, they more or less agree with themselves, but they, they, they give different results than, than a grand canonical ensemble. Grand canonical is not good to compute, for instance, fluctuations of number of atoms in condensate. And there is a side remark that you can consider for statistical ensemble, in which you would assume that energy is fixed, but the number of particles can change, which, which seems very strange, yes? Because how comes that you put atoms, but energy is the same? Uh, this is used, for instance, for the, to describe the thermal cloud in both the Einstein condensation regime, because then these atoms which are in both the Einstein condensate, they can be treated as a reservoir, but all of them, they have zero energy, they are in the ground state, so we can put atoms from condensate to the thermal cloud without changing energy, so this is this ensemble. It's called Maxwell-Demon ensemble, because the underlying idea is that you have uh, like two systems, two separate systems, one of cold atoms, the second of, uh, of uh, one of cold and the second of uh, hot atoms, like in uh, this creature, Maxwell Demon. Just to remind you, this was such a creature which was able to but open uh, some barrier between two containers at a time which was uh, chosen by this uh, by this demon, and then in this way, the demon was able to uh, separate cold and hot atoms, so also decrease entropy. Of course, opening or closing barrier always costs energy, so there is no paradox, but uh, such thing was uh, considered, at, and this four statistical ensemble is called maxwell demon ensemble. It was introduced in this PRL paper, and uh, uh, two authors of this paper are, are in this room. There's Professor Mariusz Gajda and Professor Zonzewski. So there was Zbyszek, Zbyszek i Dziaszek. So, uh, conclusion uh, is that uh, Einstein used grand canonical ensemble, which is not good ensemble to describe experiments. And the better choice would be canonical ensemble. So, how we compute things using uh, canonical ensemble? So, we have to consider density matrix, where we have this Boltzmann factor e to minus beta, where beta is inverse of temperature, times Hamiltonian. And there, there is this uh, Kronecker delta function, which is forcing that the number of operator of the number of atoms is always equal to some chosen n. In this way, we have state with fixed number of atoms. 
this, in this normalization factor, there is this z, which is partition function, is just trace of this Boltzmann factor. And uh, actually, it's impossible to find explicit formulas for, let's say, probability of having exactly 10 atoms in, in condensate uh, if you have uh, plenty of atoms. There are no uh, computations in com some calculations in canonical ensemble do not lead to compact analytical results we, in 3D. We, we are using uh, numerics always, and very useful is this recurrence, which is actually relatively easy to, to derive, that uh, if you would like to compute this partition function, it can be expressed as the sum in which you have partition function but of smaller number of atoms times partition function of a single atom but at a lower temperature. So one can derive this formula and uh, try to put it to computer to, to find these uh, partition functions. And then if you are asking, oh, there's a mistake, sorry. If you uh, would ask about probability of having in condensate more than m atoms, then it's uh, given by this formula. So there's partition function with n minus m atoms times this uh, Boltzmann factor divided by, by z. And, uh, in experiments, often there are like one million atoms. K is integer. B beta is one over t. So, um, okay. If you would like to what we have to do sometimes uh, to compute the real systems, then we have millions of atoms, and then computing this is quite demanding, actually, especially that there are these partition functions of our different order of magnitudes. So, well, I, I program it, but uh, I had to keep in memory like 100 uh, digits. This was the precision which was needed to compute partition function for one million atom. But you can do it. And here is the result. Here is the fluctuation of the number of atoms in the condensate divided by n as a function of temperature. And uh, my result is, is this uh, thick black line. This green dashed line, which is going up, it's matching only close to critical temperature, is the result in frame of the grand canonical ensemble. So you see that it's completely not matching this Grant, this is canonical one. There are many estimations for lower temperatures, below, much below critical temperature. One of them is, is given uh, here with this red line. And then simply when you, uh, when you use these analytical approximations at the critical temperature, you can find some approximation for maximal fluctuation. And maximal fluctuation of the condensate or maximal dispersion, dispersion of these fluctuations is proportional to the square root of the number of atoms. But as I said, this is approximate result. There, are, there is no exact result for these fluctuations. Yes? So, uh, uh, we are learned during the courses of statistical mechanics that all ensembles are equivalent in the <laughs> thermodynamic limit. Yes. So your picture is uh, intensive, right? Yes. You have intensive quantities. So how, how it can happen that in thermodynamic limit all of them will be equivalent? They, they are not equivalent in thermodynamic limits, so, uh, so the these lectures are wrong. And uh, indeed, the <laughs> what, you <laughs> <laughs> what you said... So this question is a good question. It was addressed by uh, especially the Steve Ullenbeck and Mark Katz paper. And they focus on exactly on what you are asking. So yes. uh, if different ensembles are equivalent and in thermodynamic limit, and the answer is that uh, not with respect to all quantities. And for instance, fluctuations of the number of atoms in the ground state, uh, they are not equivalent when computed in, in, in different ensembles. Well. Yes, there is no reason, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Whether you fix energy or the number of particles. And therefore, why the fluctuation? Yes, but in one ensemble you have chemical potential, in the second ensemble there is no such quantity, so also there, there is some problem. You don't measure the uh, chemical potential, you measure the energy of the system, you measure yeah. the energy of particles, you measure different things, right? And yes. The averages are in all ensembles the same. Yes. I agree that fluctuations are different. And actually, if you compute uh, average number of atoms in the condensate, then it's it's, it's, it gives the same result in all ensembles. It's the same. It's the same in the grand canonical and in, a, in canonical. In thermodynamic limit, of course. So we see that already for ideal gas there are some interesting questions. Actually there are many prominent physicists involved in this topic. Even in the statistics of the ideal gas, like David Politzer, so this um, Nobel Prize winner who also, I think, was, was the first or one of the first person who computed fluctuations of uh, condensate but in the harmonic trap, which was more relevant to experiment. But uh, I, I show you. I have shown you many. Uh, I have shown you the. Uh, yes. I have shown you the experiments with the when the average number of atoms versus temperature was measured. It was there's plenty of such experiments, but until now there was no measurement of fluctuations. So this curve I'm. I, I'm plotting here. I. Well, one year ago, I wouldn't be able to show you any experiment to that. It's very difficult to measure fluctuations. And why it's difficult to measure fluctuations? Because, for instance, um, I said to you that to cool down the atoms, the evaporative cooling is, uh, is used. So evaporative cooling is such a process that randomly some atoms are, are somehow taken out of the condensate, are taken out of the system. And it's one of the things which is causing uh, huge fluctuations of the total number of atoms, which are Poissonian, uh, Poissonian fluctuations. So if you have one million atoms, then from one side the, the dispersion of the number of atoms in the condensate should be also of this order, one, like 1,000, which is the same order as the uh, fluctuations of the total number of atoms, which are Poissonian one, which are square root of the total number of atoms also, which is also 1,000. So the noise coming from the, just the fluctuation of the total number of atoms is of the order of the effect we'd like to measure. And this is problem. It also actually, other is that if you would like to measure uh, these fluctuations of atoms in the condensate, then the relative precision in, a, in a distinguishing atom from condensate versus any other atom is uh, below 1%. So you need to, you have to count atoms very precisely. And you have one million atom is atoms, it's not so easy to, to count uh, exactly the, their number with the precision 1000. There are other problems, like how to determine what is the temperature, one has to avoid uh, some sources of heating, there are many things. But uh, especially recently, we were witnessing uh, some new achievements in, uh, in experiments. Uh, so people were motivated mostly by metrology and production of entangled states. And there was a group in Hanover who invented uh, different techniques to, to decrease these fluctuations of the total number of atoms. And they finally they have shown they have some uh, twin Fox states, which was important for metrology. 
but uh, in a way they 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 were able to decrease these fluctuations of the total no number of atoms by by different uh, techniques and one technique is that they use a uh, faraday effect so if you have some medium and there is light is going through this medium the light is polarized as on this uh, picture there is linear polarization if there is additional magnetic field involved like in this picture then the direction of this polarization behind this medium will be will be changed will be rotated and this angle of rotation it depends on uh, of course on this magnetic field but also on the number of atoms which were there so in this way you can uh, shine just light through both the einstein condensate you can measure the polarization behind and you can estimate what was the number in the in the condensate without destroying it and if you do it uh, several times in in a Danish group of uh, Jan Art, they're doing like usually like 50, 50 such small experiments, they can determine what is the number of atoms, but with a precision which is much better than uh, Poissonian fluctuations. They have methods to also remove some excess of atoms, so they measure what is the number of atoms, and let's say that their goal is to have exactly uh, half a million, and they measure that they, have, uh, they had half a million plus 1,000, they can remove on demand 1,000 atoms. In this way, they can reach a sample which more or less, well, well-defined number of atoms. And there is this group of Jan Art uh, in Denmark which has very exceptional resolution concerning the number of atoms. They can count number of atoms quite uh, precisely. And this is the result of, uh, of the group from Orus. Here is the condensate fraction as a function of temperature. Uh, this dashed curve would be for a thermodynamic limit. Uh, this uh, dashed but red is, uh, is uh, for ideal gas but uh, with finite size corrections. And different points are results of experiments. So you see there's a lot of points. So they did a lot of measurements. They had very nice statistics. Uh, just for experts, they used half a million of atoms. They used rubidium and they had trap which was, uh, I would say, quasi 1D. It was just elongated, like uh, cigar-shaped. Because there are two, uh, two high frequency in, uh, let's say, Y and Z direction, and uh, the trap was shallow in the X direction, so it's like cigar-shaped. And they did uh, a lot of work about the data analysis. They, they measured uh, different correlations independently. That's why you see two colors here because these gray points, it's before data analysis, before using some correlations, and then by using their uh, quite well sophisticated uh, analysis, they, they, they were able to decrease some noise, they, they were able to reduce noise, and uh, after uh, some post-processing, uh, uh, the data were less scattered. These new data are the blue ones. Yes, they, f they see that, uh, they know that in, uh, in their way of, of cooling and, uh, and uh, finding what is the number of atoms, they have some correlation between, for instance, temperature and the total number of atoms. And they can use this scaling to, to shift some points in a systematic way. Okay, and what's that? This is the first measurement of fluctuation of the number of atoms in the condensate. These are these dots. And uh, the solid black line is uh, theory for the ideal gas. There is also this uh, gray background, which is uh, noise. So they had to somehow include their noise. And they did this as an offset. But you see that there is discrepancy between ideal gas result and these experimental points. They, they are, they ha there is this quench just below the critical temperature of, of uh, experimental points, but it's shifted if you compare it with the ideal gas. So uh, one could think what is the reason for this shift? And the main one is connected with interaction. So now a few words about interacting systems. Uh, we are speaking about uh, neutral atoms, so the interaction between, between them is very, very weak. The dominant part is van der Waals interaction, 
which for cold atoms is well modeled by this uh, delta potential. So if you have one atom in position R1 and the second at position R2, then the potential between them is, uh, is delta distribution of the difference R1 minus R2, and there is this prefactor. And in this prefactor, there is uh, h bar p, pi and, and mass, and this a is the only parameter which is uh, covering the, the strength of the interaction, let's say. It's called scattering length. So the first question which is important to ask is, what, what is the shift to the critical temperature due to interactions? And first, I will start with uh, some discussion of this shift, but in case of the box with periodic boundary condition. Historically, this was the, the relevant thing. So, so we have to uh, we have to assume that temperature is very low and below certain in the digital regime in, in a, for low temperatures it doesn't matter. If you would have to look at the interaction between uh, fast particles, this model would be wrong. Okay, so th what is the history of computing the shift to the critical temperature? in case with interactions. So the, the study started in, a, in, a, in the 50s of the 20th century, and first there was the result of Lee and Yang, and they said, well, due to the interaction, the critical temperature is shifted by square root of the scattering length. But then the same authors, one year later, they said, no, actually we were uh, wrong, and this shift is uh, proportional to A. But then uh, there was another paper in which it was said that actually the first result was correct and this shift is square root of A. What, what are the units here? Because the shift is in energy. Yeah, uh, shift versus uh, Yeah, the C, the C is in some units such that it's, an, it's temperature at the end. So well, the discussion of C is another story, but C has to have some units, for instance, or we have to just divide by, by um, critical temperature of the ideal gas. Okay, and then Glasgow, he said that, uh, no, Huang, Huang, in 1964 said actually uh, there is this positive shift, but it's like A to power three halves, and 18 years later Toyota found that the shift is negative, and proportional to square root of A, and it was confirmed numerically, and there was experiment, but the experiment was uh, actually super, super uh, fluid, for it was helium, in which the interactions are strong, and this is completely different regime than the regime of, uh, of weakly interacting gas. And once techniques of uh, cooling atoms were better and better, people came back to this problem, they computed ag again this shift to the critical temperature, and they found, Stuff in 1992, that this shift is positive, proportional to A. Then there was a bunch of paper of Kepperly. He was using a path integral Monte Carlo method, this was just numerics, and he said, no, this shift is negative. But then uh, there were a bunch of papers when they decided finally that this shift is positive, but they were not sure about the coefficient. And finally, the last result is, seems to be correct one. So we know now the shift, the critical temperature, but in a box. And our system is not box. Our system is harmonic trap. And there is no, well, there is still some debate about uh, in, in harmonic traps. Is this not the same situation as it was in the supercooling helium, where nobody calculated the critical temperature, but the number of atoms in the Uh, uh, I agree. I don't know. It was. It's it's maybe related because most of these people indeed they were interested in in helium, and actually this result of Toyota, which was confirmed uh, by experiment, it it was for helium, and then uh, we realized well we have gases, it's a different system, and uh, that's why here I have continuation of this debate. Uh, the last successful method was based on something which is called classical field approximation. 
So now a few words about this classical field approximation. It's important because this method, which was also invented partially in, uh, here in Warsaw, and I think the main authors from Warsaw side is, uh, is Professor Gaida, uh, Professor Zonjewski, and uh, there was also important, I think, impact of Professor Brewczyk, probably. And, but very briefly, I, I don't have much time, actually. Uh, so, first, in a, if you want to compute something in a, in a frame of the quantum mechanics, you have density matrix, then the average value of the observable is just the trace of the density matrix with this observable. Usually, we are using uh, annihilation and creation operators, which uh, these are op bosonic operators which uh, annihilate atoms at different orbitals we, we had to choose. And then uh, in the canonical, uh, the total number of atoms is this operator is just the sum of occupations of different energy levels. In canonical ensemble, we demand that this will be equal to n. But uh, one can write down a also classical version. And uh, maybe let me remind you that uh, when actually quantum optics was uh, was invented, before there was just the uh, classical description of light, and they had this problem that when they wanted to derive the what is called now Planck's law, they had an ultraviolet catastrophe. But initially there was classical uh, picture and then uh, quantum appeared. Here we would do other other way around. You have the quantum picture and you would like to use classical one, at least for some averages. So classical uh, field picture would be the following. You would have to replace the uh, operators, annihilation creation operators by, by numbers, by uh, classical amplitudes. It's like in quantum optics, that sometimes it's enough to replace the annihilation operator with the amplitude of corresponding coherent state. But then we know that there is this ultraviolet catastrophe, you have to avoid it, that's why you have to choose appropriate cutoff. So we have just a finite number of modes. Um, in 3D, it's usually hundreds of modes. And then density matrix is replaced by the distribution in this phase space. So we can think about this alpha, these amplitudes as, as uh, uh, coordinates of the, of the phase space. And uh, if you would like to compute some averages, like average number of atoms in the condensate, first you have to replace the quantum object with its classical counterpart, so one has to write O as a function of creation annihilation operators and then replace the creation annihilation operators with complex amplitudes. And if you are interested in average, you have to compute integral instead of uh, some sums with a distribution which is this uh, classical distribution in the phase space. Uh, what means that the finally some averages are computed as integrals when this cut of K, it can be like a few hundreds so this is integral in the space which has like hundreds of dimensions. So it's not easy to compute. But knowing something about this function, uh, about this probability distribution, you can uh, improve uh, integration. And there are well-known techniques like Monte Carlo calculation using Metropolis algorithm in which it's, uh, well, in frame of which one, one can compute such integrals. And this is what we what we did, and the first thing we were interested was the shift, but not to the critical temperature, but shift to the maximal fluctuation of number of atoms in the condensate. So here is the ratio between this maximal fluctuation for the interacting system versus maximal fluctuation for the ideal gas as a function of uh, density and scattering length. So think about it as a function of, of uh, interaction. And there are many results. Our results are this, this red and blue, and they have error bars because we used Monte Carlo uh, techniques and we had some statistical errors we could uh, estimate. But there are other results from different papers. There are many groups which attack the problem and the groups received different results. That's why these points are scattered. 
So the truth is that no one can compute exactly what are, what are these fluctuations for interacting system. There is no such result. For tr well, there is no this this A is it, it governs uh, interaction. Yeah. Some results are positive, some results are negative, uh, concerning the sign of, of, of sheets. There is no agreement. Fortunately, the experiments of all those I was showing you, it was for a very weak interaction. And for very weak interaction, we have seen that this, uh, there is practically no shift. So fortunately, scanning is showed that for experiment, it doesn't matter so much. And then we, another important effect for all those, uh, was uh, the geometry, that they had no three spherical 3D geometry, but they had this elongated trap. And we found actually that the fluctuations of this, the maximal fluctuations, they strongly depend on the geometry. So actually, these shifts due to interactions are much, much less important than shifts due to geometry. Here we have two curves. Blue is for a symmetric trap, and uh, red is for, for the trap from, uh, from Aorus experiment. On the x-axis, we have number of atoms, so they were somewhere here, half a million of atoms. And, uh, well, these shifts related to geometry and discrepancies were probably more important than, uh, than interactions. Uh, concerning shifts to the critical temperature, but in a, in a trap, there is so-called a mean field uh, correction. So if you have ideal gas, then you know that the ground state it's just a Gaussian in, in a harmonic trap. But then if you would ask the question, what is the shape of the condensate for the interacting system, you'd find that it has nothing to do with the, with the, with the uh, Gaussian, with this, with this uh, orbital for non-interacting system. You have to compute it separately. We know how to do it using uh, gross pitaevsky equation. And then you'll find that, well, because atoms repel each other, uh, then uh, the shape of the condensate, the shape of the cloud, is changed. So it broadens, and because of that, the density in the middle goes down. And as there is some decrease of uh, density in the middle, and Einstein derivation was based on the critical density, you can use actually Einstein results, include the decrease of uh, density due to interaction, and you'll find some correction. This is some semi-classical analysis, which is usually done. And you will find that this correction uh, is given by this formula for experiment from Aorus. It was like minus 3.77% of temperature of uh, ideal gas, critical temperature of the ideal gas. You have to include finite size effects. There are some estimation for, uh, for, for shifts of critical temperature due to, uh, due to correlation between atoms. The whole, the whole problems in, in box were just uh, actually uh, devoted to, to this correction. And if you add all these corrections, you will find that uh, the current theory will give you minus 4.6% of shift of critical temperature. In the experiment, they observed uh, around minus 4, but I would say with plus minus 1%. The That's why you have this uh, red curve which is actually constructed from the ideal gas, but rescaling, rescaling uh, the temperature scale but to account all these corrections. Because for unfortunately, there is, no, uh, exact, there is no way to compute exactly these fluctuations, so one has to do, do some, some tricks, some cheating, so actually. And then we see that, well, from our perspective, this uh, red curve, so let's say theory is matching the experiment, and so we wrote the paper, which was uh, accepted in physical regulators. Actually, it has editorial suggestion. And uh, this is the first measurement of fluctuation of the number of atoms in the condensate. I should uh, acknowledge all peoples which were involved in the study of the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in a, in at finite temperature. There are many peoples from Warsaw and uh, and the uh, Białystok who are involved, the main people are definitely Professor Zonjewski, Professor Gajda, and Professor Brewczyk. 
But there are, during the last, I know, two decades, like uh, a lot of people who are involved in different aspects of classical fields uh, analysis of different effects which arise due to uh, finite temperature, like uh, Krzysztof Gural, who is now in uh, KNF, Łukasz Zawitkowski, Zbigniew Fidziaszek, there is Przemek Bienias, with whom I actually started this, uh, using this multi-precision uh, libraries. Uh, for this work, there was student Michał Iglicki, who uh, used classical field approximation to, to compute these uh, effects due to interactions. And there is Piotr Dewar in the Institute of Physics, uh, who specialized in, in, a, in a optimizing this cutoff. But he, of course, he wrote a lot of, uh, he found a lot of uh, nice phenomena in, in uh, Bose Einstein condensate. Emilia Witkowska, Tomek Świstwolski, many others. In the University of Białystok, there was uh, Mirosław Brewczyk, and a lot of things has been computed by uh, Tomek Karpiuk and, and Krzysztof Gawryluk. As a summary, well, I told you about uh, what is Bose Einstein condensate. It was predicted in 1924. And uh, the fluctuations of this uh, number of atoms in condensate were, were me measured just recently in our paper, which will be published this year. It's already approved and uh, it's after proofs. Uh, there are still problems. I, as I said, you, there are no nice theory for interacting system, for thermodynamics of interacting system. There are different approaches which are not matching. And there are a few, uh, well, other things connected with uh, BC. So now the, a lot of groups is, is working on a quantum, quantum droplets to see you what is the trend in this, uh, in this field. And uh, there are many groups who would like to push, who use, who'd like to use uh, condensate in quantum technologies. There's metrology, quantum simulators. And also we, we are now uh, studying this many body effects. So thank you for your attention. That's it. Okay, any questions? So maybe I can actually now uh, add some details. So about my original question, mm -hmm. that you do this uh, everything in the initial motion frame, because I can imagine that uh, there might be some internal degrees of freedom like phonons in this condensate, right? And if you would have external uh, tidal field coming through, you might uh, imagine... External what? Excuse me. Like phonons, yes. right? Oh. Yeah, in condensate. I guess okay. if you, this could be probably used somehow to measure the gravitational waves going through the condensate. But so I was wondering how, because uh, you didn't mention any internal degrees of freedom like phonons and sound horizon. Uh, but I guess I was wondering how large of number of atoms you would need to get to to measure weak effects that would. Uh, I guess this is because this depends on the of, on the fluctuation you discussed. I mean, <coughs> I would say that most of the experiment is done in a not close to the critical temperature, but close to, well, the lowest temperature they can reach, and then almost all atoms are in the, in the condensate. And this is a good regime to study such effects like uh, phonons, for instance. And there is a lot of uh, research about, uh, about phonons concerning some relation to gravity. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of experiment to simulate like horizon in a, in a Bose-Einstein condensate. And this has been already done. There are nice papers showing, for instance, some equivalent of uh, Unruh effect. But to measure with uh, phonons such things like gravitational wave, it's completely impossible. I mean, uh, we do not have, even if there will be some impact on them, which is not clear, uh, it's out of, it's out of uh, precision we have. It's impossible now, but you would say there's no physical principle that stop us, and we need to be very patient or live very long, I guess. <laughs> Maybe, yes. There's you space where you could yeah. make the trap very, very weak, and the condensate huge. Then maybe. Um, but condensate is used already to, to measure very precisely uh, uh, magnetic field. So there are magnetic field sensors which are based on Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, any other questions? If no, let's thank Krzysztof once again.